I'd like to preface this by saying that not all mental health professionals are terrible people. Good doctors and medication have saved my life. I also didn't grow up in the U.S., so if you see something in this story that makes you go that's not how that works, keep in mind that other countries might have different laws. Furthermore, this describes my experiences with staying at a mental hospital, so prepare for triggers. Alright, here we go. I was a troubled kid. I'm kind of a troubled person in general. But when I was in my early teens, specifically when I was 14, I was cutting, suicidal, and refusing to go to school. So I was put on a waiting list for a children's mental hospital. I know now that the fact that I was on that waiting list for close to half a year should have been the first warning sign. At the time, I enjoyed being on sick leave from school, which basically meant I got to play The Sims until 6 in the morning for 5 months straight. But when I had to pack my stuff to actually go to the hospital, I, of course, didn't really want to go. I wanted to get help, don't get me wrong, but the idea of being away from home for six weeks, which is the standard time they take to analyze and watch you to give you a diagnosis, after which you can choose to pursue treatment, scared me. I arrived at the hospital in tears, my mom carrying my suitcase for me. The nurses noticed that obviously didn't want to stay. Are you here of your own free will? The doctor asked me. I shook my head. They just shrugged it off, saying they could get a judicial decision forcing me to stay there. I never got to talk to a judge, I never got to defend or explain myself, and as far as I know, my parents didn't talk to a judge either. A judge glossed over my medical history and then signed a piece of paper that forced me to stay in this hellhole for six weeks. The contents of my suitcase were searched and I remember feeling like I had just arrived in prison. The first terrifying thing happened on my first night. As a cutter, my arms were in horrific shape. When wounds heal, they itch. I scratched open some of my old scabs and when I went to the nurse to ask for a bandage, everyone went nuts. In their eyes, I had purposely harmed myself. Which they couldn't prove, but okay. So what do you do when a 14-year-old mental patient harms herself? Talk to her? Try to help? Not. Nah. You take away all her jewelry, a necklace from my mom and a bracelet from my ex-girlfriend, who, at the time, I still had very strong feelings for, and send her off to the timeout room. 4. 24 hours. The timeout room was a small room with a big window that could just barely fit a bed. If I had to use the bathroom, I had to ask a nurse to accompany me. And, no joke, at one point I was in the bathroom, with a nurse standing guard in front of the door. She asked if I was doing okay, and I sarcastically responded with, No, I'm cutting myself with the toilet paper. She goes, Really? And rips open the door. Freaking Christ. All of my clothes, including underwear and PJs, were taken from my room and kept in the front office for the time I stayed in the timeout room. So whenever I needed clothes, I had to go up to the front office to ask for them. But apart from having to ask for clothes and bathroom trips, I was completely left alone in that room. No one ever came to check on me. Getting out of the timeout room wasn't a lot better. For the first week or two, I had horrible stomach problems. I would get up multiple times a night to use the bathroom which, by the way, you didn't have one of in your room. You had to walk down the hall to the bathrooms. Because my stomach kept me up all night, I would often not get enough sleep and end up sleeping through the day, which led to me not taking part in group activities. And instead of, I don't know, waking me up, I was irritated at that, and I quote, if I was up all night, roaming the halls, I'd be tired too. What? Do you want me to just crap the bed, or? And because I didn't partake in group activities, I couldn't earn outside time. Yes, I had to earn going outside. Even just sitting on the front steps with a nurse right next to me had to be earned. So for the first six weeks, I was effectively locked up, except for school and weekends, where I was allowed to go home. It was blatantly obvious that none of the nurses really cared about any of the patients. They weren't even real nurses. They were more like prison guards. One of them straight up looked like a homeless guy. Another sounded like she'd been a five packs a day smoker her life and all, and I mean all, of them were chain smokers. Every free second they had they'd use for smoke breaks. 
right outside the door, too, with the doors open, so that all the other kids who were currently going through nicotine withdrawals could smell the cigarette smoke. I saw a real nurse once a week. She mainly checked for self-harm. One time, I self-harmed at home over the weekend. I told her my pet bunny did it. And she believed me. Within six weeks of staying at the mental hospital, I saw a psychiatrist a whooping two times. Once for a general introduction and once for an IQ test. Oh, and did I mention that you were allowed to have a razor in the shower? Or the huge bird spider that sat in the corner of one of showers for the entire time I stayed there? Or the cobwebs and silverfish that were everywhere? Anyone who's ever struggled with mental illness probably knows that sentences like just pull yourself together or get over it are the least helpful things one could say to a mentally ill person. I've never heard it that much in my entire life. There was one instance where another patient, who was deadly afraid of spiders, came running out of her room in a borderline panic attack because she had woken up to a spider directly in front of her face. Know what they told her? Don't be such a baby, it's just a spider. They gave her a broom for her to get rid of the spider herself. Which obviously, she couldn't do. My roommate and I ended up helping her. Both of us were scared of spiders as well, mind you. But possibly the most outrageous thing happened on my second to last day. Someone had told the guards that I had smuggled in a razor blade. So they pulled me out of breakfast and searched my body from top to bottom, stripping me naked. With the door to the nurse's room wide open. When they didn't find a razor blade on me, they tore apart my room. They didn't find one there either, but found one laying on the floor in the hallway. It was even still in its wrapper. I wasn't the only patient who cut herself. As a matter of fact, I don't think there was a single female patient who didn't cut herself. That blade could have belonged to anyone. They had no proof it was mine. But of course, it was deemed that it was mine. And despite me not having any new cuts on my arm, I was thrown into the timeout room for another 24 hours. Literally my last 24 hours. And they paid so little attention to the timeout room that a fellow inmate was able to slip a letter with a razor blade inside under the door so I could take out my frustrations on myself. In case any of you were wondering where my parents were in all of this, my mother wanted to get me out of that place as soon as she heard about the timeout room. But since my parents had joint custody, she needed my father to agree to it. My father deserves a let's not meet story for himself, but to make it short, he hadn't talked to me in over four years, but was somehow convinced that I needed help and refused to get me out of there. My final diagnosis from that place? Narcissistic neurosis. I was 14. And to this day, I have no idea how they came up with any kind of diagnosis, considering I had seen an actual doctor a total of two times. Additionally, this result was delivered to us, my parents and I, by the head doctor of the hospital, who I had never seen in my life, during a conclusive meeting on my last day. I was offered to stay and start behavioral therapy, but I guess it goes without saying that I politely declined that offer. Every therapist and psychiatrist I have talked to since has disregarded that diagnosis entirely. Some have even laughed at it. I'm currently diagnosed with bipolar disorder slash depression and a panic disorder, and my current psychiatrist has suggested I might suffer from borderline personality disorder. I guess the moral of this story is to always do research on the hospital you plan on getting yourself admitted to. I sure hope I never have to see any of the guards, nurses, or doctors ever again. I was a 22-year-old female who worked at a popular theme park for several years while also attending college and holding down two other jobs at the same time. I seemed to get sick a lot during this period of my life. In hindsight, I now realize that it was likely due to not sleeping much, eating well, drinking enough water, and being exposed to hundreds of people on a daily basis. On a busy weekend, I picked up a late shift to make a little extra holiday pay. I had been assigned to an area with a lot of guest flow, and the three to four of us running that spot were getting overwhelmed rather quickly. At some point, while trying to tell a guest he couldn't stay where he had parked his family, the guest got confrontational. I had been assaulted by park goers before while working, so I completely froze up. 
This guest was in my face, screaming about how I was ruining his vacation, when I saw a shadow appear from behind me. A very large man in a similar uniform to mine was standing behind me, staring down the belligerent guest. Behind him was another large man, same uniform, telling the guest that he needed to move on or they would call security. I was so relieved. The guest left, and the two men stayed near me the rest of the evening to make sure I wasn't bothered again. The second co-worker, Mac, asked me all kinds of questions about my life and where I usually worked. I was so grateful for their support, I think I answered his questions for the next two to three hours while we finished up our shifts. At the end of the evening, Mac asked for my phone number, and I gave it to him. He wasn't really my type, but I figured it was the least I could do after how much he and his friend had helped me. We ended up going on a date about a week later. It wasn't a very long date, and I realized pretty early on that I still really wasn't interested in him as anything more than friends. When we went to part ways, Mac asked when he could see me again. I tried to gently turn him down as nicely as possible, telling him I would be up for being friends, but nothing else. He protested, begging for one more date, and I could tell that he was pretty angry. I shook my head again, apologizing profusely, not wanting to be rude. His face was flushed with anger by now, and he forced a too long hug on me before I could walk away. It was a big theme park, and we didn't normally work in the same area, so I left feeling some relief at knowing I probably wouldn't see him again. My phone started going off constantly. Text after text, paragraphs asking for another chance. Telling me that we were meant to be and that our meeting had been fate. He really did think that he was my knight in shining armor and could not seem to understand why I wasn't interested. After countless messages back telling him I really didn't see him that way, I finally blocked his number. About a week later, one of my zone co-workers came up to me asking if I was dating a manager in another area. Mac had evidently been telling people that he and I were going steady. I vehemently denied it to my co-worker and to several others that came up to me throughout the day. A few days later, I saw him waiting near the entrance to the payroll office, seemingly looking for someone. Before I could think to avoid him, he spotted me and ran up to say hello. I remember his eyes being too wide, smile just a little off-putting. He repeatedly said how much he had enjoyed our date, that he couldn't wait for the next one. There were lots of people walking around nearby, so I mumbled that I still wanted to just be friends, and pretended that someone walking by was my roommate. Told him I had to go so I could get a ride home. His face contorted with anger again, and he tried to grab my arm, saying he would give me a lift home, but I dodged. Before he could try again, I slipped into the crowd. I remember feeling my heart banging against my chest and kept checking behind me the entire walk to the parking lot. He just stood outside the payroll office, his face red, staring at me as I walked away. A few days later, I was sick again. I got on antibiotics, but my body had, unknown to me, developed an immunity to that brand of medication. I kept taking those pills for a week, not understanding why I was just getting worse. My roommate finally came home from work one afternoon to find me literally gasping for air from my bed. She rushed me to the ER, where they admitted me for a high fever and pneumonia. That first night, after being admitted, one of my lungs collapsed. The hospital told me that I was going to be there for a while. My roommate only told a few of our close friends that I was in the hospital. They visited when they could, bringing me books to read and keeping me updated on work. One told me that a manager from another zone had been stopping by almost daily to see if I was there. I felt my blood run cold and my heart rate ticked up on the monitor by my bed. I tried to sleep while I could after they left, but between the machines, the nurses checking in every hour, and worrying over Max seeking me out, I could only manage hazy naps. The next day, I was woken up from one of these sporadic naps by a knock at the door. Except for a nurse, I tried to sit up completely, but didn't have the energy. Through sleepy, blurred vision, I saw a large man enter the room. It was a Mac. I felt my heart start pounding again. He was carrying flowers and had that creepy smile on his face again. I was literally stuck, couldn't move to get away, and no one was around. 
The nurse call button on my bedside was broken. The nurse had already warned me about it, saying they would just be monitoring my vitals from the desk closely until it could be fixed. I could not believe that he was here. How did he even find out that I was here? He came and sat next to the bed, grabbing my hand in a too tight grip. He told me that he was worried after not seeing me at work anymore that he wanted to check on his girl. The heart rate monitor was beeping pretty steadily now and must have triggered something at the nurse's station. I still couldn't breathe very well, long-winded speech was hard, and I was internally freaking out, so I was just replying to his chattering and questions with quiet, single-syllable words. After what felt like an eternity, but must have only been a few minutes, a nurse walked in. Max's grip on my hand grew even tighter, prompting something akin to a squeak from me as my hand felt crushed in his. The nurse must have seen the look on my face, and after a split-second glance between Mac and I, she asked him to step out so she could check me over. He dropped the flowers on the table and grudgingly walked out of the room. Before the door shut, he looked back at me and said he'd come back as soon as she was done. When the door closed, the nurse asked if I was okay. I shook my head no. She asked if I wanted him to come back. I managed a raspy not at all. She didn't pry, didn't ask, but told me that she would take care of it. Grabbing a quarantine sign out of a cabinet near the entrance to my room, she hung it on the outside of my door. I heard him arguing with her for five to ten minutes before it finally got quiet again. She told me afterward that he had finally left and that she made a note at the nurse's station not to let him in again. I thanked her and asked if she could throw the flowers away outside the room. Just looking at them was giving me the creeps. I was there for another two weeks. They didn't want to release me too early given my medical history. I asked my roommate to pick up a gift card the day before I left so I could give it to the nurse who had been so kind and perceptive during my stay. I didn't return to work for another two to three weeks after that. My lung capacity took another month to fully be back to what it was before. When I got back, I asked a couple of friends of mine if they had told Mac that I was hospitalized and where I was hospitalized. There were several large medical centers in the area. I didn't think he could have found out by calling every single department. They said they had only told our head manager that I was there when she asked why I'd been gone for so long. I now assumed that he found out from her. I spent the next several months looking over my shoulder and scanning rooms before entering. I thought I spotted him sitting in his car in our lot a few times, but was never 100% sure. I made sure I was never alone going out to my car in the evenings. I eventually found out that he'd been force transferred to another park for reasons no one was told. I hadn't said anything to HR, so my best guess was something other than his apparent interest in me. I never saw him again. So, stalker ex coworker Mac, let's not meet again. I'm an EMT, and I have been for about three years now. I live and work in Southern California, and this particular transport happened when I was a brand new EMS worker for four months at a private ambulance company. This company was a private basic life support, BLS, company primarily, meaning we typically transported patients whose care provider had a contract with us. However, sometimes we would run 911 calls out of prisons. This is where our story begins. It was late into the night at our station when I heard the tone from my radio, Unit 221 Priority Response to State Prison for an Unknown Medical. Copy, wheels up in two, I replied. I walked over to my partner who was sleeping on our rec area couch. Rise, sweet prince, a life needs saving, I sarcastically exclaimed. We hopped into the rig, the engine roared to life, and we set off, lights blazing, sirens wailing. As we approached the prison, we killed the lights and sirens and proceeded with the routine security check. Once the guards were satisfied with the search, we were given access and led through the gates and parked outside the medical bay. Gurney and medical equipment in tow, we entered the prison hospital. Now because my partner was the patient person for the last call, I was going to be the primary care provider for this patient. Now, though I had been a pretty new EMT, I had done a lot of prison transports in a small period of time. I've had inmates scream at me, try to bribe me, and yes, even try to kill me. 
so as you can imagine, I really wasn't looking for fight night on Unit 221 at 4 in the morning. Regardless, I always prepared for the worst. We were escorted in by guards as usual and led into the main area of the hospital's rooms, which were still fitted as cells. I was approached by a nurse who gave me a sheet of paper with his information and most recent vitals. I began to ask for the turnover report and why this patient required transport and where we were transporting to. The nurse stared blankly for a moment before he said, you're going to Scripps Mercy Shores Hospital Room 329. He's going because he doesn't feel well and he needs some tests done. He shouldn't be a problem for you. Already a few silent alarms were going off in my head. Scripps Mercy Shores is a rich people hospital. I have never heard of anyone other than someone wealthy going there, let alone a prisoner. Second, not feeling well and needs tests don't really paint me a great picture for why he needs to go and what I'll be dealing with. And finally, what does he shouldn't be a problem for you mean? If he's a violent inmate or even an at-risk patient, they'd normally just say so. Getting an actual report on this patient's health and medical condition was like getting blood from a stone. I decided to just relent and go ahead with the transport. The prison guards brought the shackled patient out to us, another oddity, every other time I'd go in and talk with them before getting them onto the gurney. Standing before me was a tall, rather frail-looking man of dark complexion. His eyes were red and sunken. His overall demeanor was a fearful one. He was constantly shivering. He looked like hell. I introduced myself and began my whole checklist of things to ask and address. We'll call him David. He answered all my questions with a small and quivering voice. When I asked what the problem was tonight, he gave a quick and frightened glance towards the guards and the nurse, I don't feel well. His reply sounded forced and rehearsed. Abuse from the staff came to mind first, but I'd address that later. I decided to just go ahead and get this guy going and I'd wrap everything up in the ambulance. Before loading him in, I asked him the same question I asked all inmate patients, be straight with me and I'll be straight with you, are you going to cause problems once we get going? He quickly shook his head no, and we were off. When transporting prisoners, one guard accompanies the ambulance, and another follows in what's called a tail car. This is for everyone's safety and ensuring that if the patient tries anything, an official guard is there to address it. I was busy writing up my report when I realized that between the confusion of the call and the late hour, I had forgotten to get my own set of vitals. A rookie mistake. We were about halfway to our destination and the patient had remained silent this whole time. I told him I was going to take his vitals and instructed him to give me his arm so I could begin. He did so immediately, like he was trained to obey anything demanded of him, and did so with that haunting look of fear. I wrapped my blood pressure cuff around his arm and that's when I felt him for the first time. His skin was ice cold. There wasn't even a slight warmth to his skin. I asked him if he'd like a blanket, but he declined. I continued with my evaluation. I inflated the cuff, pressed my stethoscope to his brachial artery, and listened for the pulse to come back to show me his blood pressure. It didn't come back. At first I thought my stethoscope was broken, so I grabbed a spare one, same result, no pulse. I removed all my equipment and felt for his pulse myself, nothing. I looked at him and asked if he felt all right. He replied with a simple, quiet, I'm okay, thank you. Caught off guard, I grabbed my pulse oximetry, which is used to find a heart rate and blood oxygen level, and put it on his finger. After a moment of the machine reading, the heart rate came back at zero, and the blood oxygen level came back at zero. My heart dropped. I took another set of vitals to see if I misread anything, but they all came back the same, heart rate, zero blood pressure, zero blood oxygen level, zero the only thing consistent was his respiratory rate, which was 24 breaths a minute. A bit higher than the resting rate, but not alarming in itself. I looked back again and asked him once more if he's okay. He looked me in the eyes and nodded his head yes as tears welled up in his eyes, then looked away. He was completely alert. He responded perfectly to all my questions, his eyes were equal and reactive, all signs of good brain function, but no signs of a pulse or any vascular activity. 
At this point, I don't know what to think. Scientifically, there is no reason this guy should be alive. Even if he had an artificial heart, he would be showing vital signs and have a battery pack with a filter kit. But he's right in front of me, alert, breathing, talking when addressed. It makes absolutely no sense. I decided to continue investigating. I listened to his heart with my stethoscope. There was no beating. No thumping. Just the muffled sounds of his breathing. While I was there, I listened to his lungs, all clear. I had just finished listening to his chest when we pulled into our destination. We offloaded him from the ambulance, took him to the room we were instructed to, then he hopped off the gurney and was escorted to his hospital bed by the guards. I began giving my almost unbelievable turnover report to the nurse, who surprisingly didn't seem alarmed by any of it. I wrapped up my turnover and then sat down in a nearby chair to finish up my report. As I sat, typing away at my computer, I was interrupted by the sound of a hospital gurney rolling down the hallway. It was accompanied by four people in surgical gowns who entered the inmate's room with said gurney. After a few minutes, the team in surgical attire emerges from the room, the inmate strapped down to the gurney with restraints, audibly crying, and wheeling him down the hall and around the corner. That was the last I saw of him. I told my partner once we were back in the ambulance, he didn't believe me at first, which I can understand, I joke around a lot. But with the look I gave him, I knew I wasn't kidding. This story may not have been what you were expecting, it's not violent or particularly frightening, but this was hands down the most disturbing call I've ever had. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what I transported. I have my theories, such as experimental treatments being carried out on inmates. But with skin like ice, hardly any vital signs, and such a fearful demeanor, I can only wonder what kind of experiments and what kind of horrors that man had faced.